morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Yes, we are a webinar an online show um, covering a variety of uh, library related activities and topics. Um, we uh, both the um, broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but both but the show is recorded every week, so if you're unable to join us, you can always watch our recordings after the fact um, at your convenience. Um, they are all listed on our website, and I'll show you where those recordings are at the um, end of today's show. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so um, please do share with your uh, friends, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone who you think might be of interest, inter have interest in any of the topics that we have on the show, any of our upcoming shows or our archives. Um, now, Encompass Live um, uh, premiered in January of 2009, so we've been on, on the air, online, <laughs> for um, quite a long time now. So you will find a lot of our archives are old, um, old topics, um, previous topics uh, that um, there we go, that maybe are no longer up to date. <laughs> I'm trying to just see. Okay, and um, but just you know, pay you know, look at the dates. And everything has a date on it, so you'll be able to see uh, what is. Um, when something was actually originally broadcast so that you can know when that information might be from. Um, we do a variety of things here on Encompass Live, book reviews, interviews, many training sessions, demos of products and services, basically um, anything that may be of interest to libraries, libraries of all types, uh, public, academic, school, anything uh, is um, available. Um, we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff sometimes do sessions on topics that they may be, um, we maybe wanted to share from here, but we do bring in guest speakers, and that is what we have uh, for this morning. On the line of us is Erin Painter. Good morning, Erin. Good morning. Good morning. And she is from the University of Nebraska at Omaha, the Chris Library, uh, a little north of Lincoln here. So she is coming in remotely to join us. I'm in Lincoln. Um, for those of you in Nebraska, you know that's you know, about uh, 45 minutes away from each other. <laughs> Um, and she is going to tell us about um, a, a new program. And actually, this is a session that I saw Erin present actually in the spring um, at our um, Nebraska Library Association College and University section spring meeting. And it was actually at that point it was one of their lightning rounds that you did, correct? Yeah, it was about so, ten minutes maybe. Yeah, so yeah, quick and dirty. <laughs> it was very very quick. And it, but I thought it was very interesting, and especially with what's going on in the world today, it was very timely. And I wrote myself a note, um, ask her if she can expand this to an hour, <laughs> only to find out that I had actually already done that um, So um, for our uh, annual conference. So I invited her to come on the show to share it again. So um, I'm just going to hand over to you to um, take it away and tell us about how to choose our news. Yes, for sure. Okay, well, welcome to How to Choose Your News. Um, again, my name is Erin Painter. I'm a reference associate here at UNO Chris Library in Omaha. Um, so in addition to fairly routine library duties, I'm also part of the team that is responsible for most of the Comp2 library instruction. Um, so as a part of that library instruction, we developed this module concerning bias and fake news, and we also additionally developed a module surrounding information chaining. So what I want to talk about today is how we developed those modules and tweaked the modules um, based on student assessments um, and our own, you know, collaboration so that they really addressed the needs of our students and they also scaffolded very well with each other. Um, so first let me tell you a little bit about the kind of demographic of students that we teach and the specific situation we're addressing with these modules. Uh, at our university, the second semester freshmen enrolled in Comp 2 spend one week's worth of instruction in the library. During this time, they, they learn how to use library resources like the databases, the catalog, um, and physical and digital resources, but they also learn how to evaluate sources for quality. And this prepares them to write a, a major research paper, which is eight to 10 pages in length, generally. Uh, and our, our student demographic includes a good 
number of first generation students, as well as uh, a strong uh, international student presence. Uh, many of the students have never or rarely undertaken this, this large of a research project, and some of them have never even been to the library before we um, actually have this instruction with them and they spend their week in here. So essentially we are dealing with um, essential novices when it comes to information literacy. Um, so you know these are the students that you know when I'm describing our experiences teaching this module we mostly teach college freshmen um, although we do uh, have some non-traditional students or those students who waited until their last semester to fulfill the requirement for graduation. Um, of course, we see those. Uh, but the, I like to think that these strategies and the, the lessons that I'm going to describe can be adapted for just about any age group. And honestly, I don't think it's ever too early or too late to teach people how to be uh, critical consumers of information. Um, and that's essentially our goal with this module. So uh, every semester, there are between 30 to 40 sections of Comp 2. Um, each section has around 15 to 20 students in it. And the sections occur either three times a week for 50 minutes each time, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, or twice a week, generally Monday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Thursday, for 75 minutes uh, for each session. Um, and so we get them for one week's worth of instruction. So two 75 minute sessions um, or three 50 minute sessions. So it's a time frame um, that we get to teach them how to use library resources, but also how to evaluate resources. Um, we initially developed this module at the beginning of the spring semester uh, in 2017. So just about a year ago. Um, and this semester, as we all might remember, started right on the heels of the November 2016 campaign cycle and election, and of course, all of the turmoil that came with that time. I know it seems like a lifetime since then, but only a year ago, the idea of fake news as we know it today was still fairly novel. So for me at least, um, and I think for a lot of us, the election and fallout surrounding, you know, quote unquote, fake news and, you know, Russian meddling and things like that just really kind of took me by surprise, kind of blindsided me. Um, and I guess I kind of took it for granted that people dug into sources to check for truth or veracity or check their sources. Um, but the ease with which fake news could spread proved that obviously this is frequently not the case. So, you yeah, know. I, 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 I had similar feelings, and I think, I wonder if a lot of that comes from our um, positions as librarians, because that's what we do. Right. <laughs> we, we trust nothing, and we research, and we find citations and primary sources, and it's just yes. like ingrained into our heads, and it's, it's difficult when other people are not. Aware of right. That. Well, yeah. when we were doing our tech test, you were like, "You have 20 tabs open." Yeah, that's how I. <laughs> that's how I do things, <laughs> and I you think that's to. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think you know sometimes we forget that, that not everybody does that. You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously they don't, or else this fake news epidemic, I guess, would wouldn't be so. It would so exist. Yeah. <laughs> we would all have 20 tabs open. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, it was it, it wasn't just concerning for me or you know our profession, but it's it was also a, a concern for the comp two instructors. Um, so when we schedule instruction with these classes, uh, we have an outline and activities, um, you know, a general way that we approach the class, um, but we can tailor these activities to suit the individual needs of the classes. So when we, in spring 2017, when we began asking instructors um, specifically what they wanted their students to take away from their week in the library, um, of course they said, you know, how to use the databases, how to find sources, how to use all these resources that the library has, but they were starting to express 
almost every one of them starting to express concern that their students didn't understand what fake news was. Um, or really how to tell if a popular news source could be trusted and used in their research papers. Um, so to kind of address these concerns, our team began tweaking our existing active learning, learning activities and our handouts to address this you know, epidemic of fake news and bias. So going into this, we did have two models in place um, for students to use if a, to determine, you know, if a source was quote unquote good or quote unquote bad. Um, we had the CRAP test and we also had the five W's. Uh, the CRAP test was developed by librarians, I believe in California, uh, and is fairly widely used by teachers um, and librarians for, you know, teaching information literacy and evaluating resources. Um, CRAP is in case you're not aware, um, CRAP stands for Currency, Relevance, Authority, Accuracy, and Purpose. And we had this infographic already um, made up going into actually the fall of 2016 um, and uh, was created by one of our librarians here. Um, and it's a, it's a really handy handout, if you will, uh, and it, it definitely helped students when evaluating um, sources. We, it, it asks some pretty, pretty straightforward questions, you know, currency, when was it published, relevance, you know, does it relate to your topic, um, you know, authority, who wrote it, is it accurate, and why are they writing it, right? Um, we also had um, a handout worksheet called the five W's. Um, it didn't, it wasn't in this, in this form at the time. Um, but the five W's, of course, is, you know, who, what, when, where, and why. And it's a little, it's, it's pretty similar to the CRAP test and kind of had the same intention of helping students evaluate the sources that they encounter. Some instructors and some students preferred one model over the other, but, but again, they were very similar. Um, the problem was, Sometimes these fake news articles or extremely biased articles would pass these tests with these students. Um, so it, it, it could be a quote unquote, what we might consider as information professionals bad source, but for the student when they asked these questions about the, the source, um, it, it was passing the test for them. So what we decided oh, to do. That's interesting. I thought that yeah. was pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, um, you would think, I mean, and I, I think, I think one of the, I don't know, things we need to be aware of is, um, and, and, and I kind of talk about this in a, a little bit later, that we kind of take for granted some, some previous knowledge when coming into this, right? Um, that this, this idea of thinking critically about sources, um, it, it, we take it for granted, and, and these seem like pretty straightforward questions, right? Um, but, but some tests, some, some, for some students, some of these fake articles or biased articles would pass this test for them. Um, and so we, we felt like we needed to tweak it a little bit. Um, so we decided to tweak the five W's to kind of try to prompt students uh, and novice researchers to ask more nuanced and probing questions when evaluating these sources in the current news climate. So we kept the crap test as it was, um, but we modified the five W's. Um, the five W's test it still exists as a worksheet for students to fill out as they're evaluating their articles, um, but it, originally it asked pretty straightforward questions like who wrote the article, when was it published, right? Kind of like the crap test. Um, but rather than just asking, you know, who wrote the article, we decided to include questions that prompted students to ask who benefits from this information? Who have you heard discuss this? Um, what are verifiable facts? What does the language tell you about the author's opinion? Uh, when would you use this article as evidence? 
where does the site get its funding? Where are they getting their evidence? Or why does the article use the language or the images that it does? And why is that relevant? And we added these questions on the worksheet um, and highlighted them um, to point out that they were meant to uh, um, you know, identify bias as well as quality, right? Um, so when we would introduce the worksheet, we would point out the highlighted questions that were intended to help them determine um, bias. Uh, we also decided that it would be kind of cool to mirror the infographic we already had for the crap test. And so I, you know, edited that infographic and made it the five W's so that is it crap or is it biased? And then I created a two-sided PDF that we now print off and then cut down into bookmarks um, to hand out to the class during the activity. So they can take it with them. It's a little more sturdy. It's not just another piece of paper, right, that they just lose. Um, <laughs> some, um, some of the instructors here will use the worksheet and the bookmark. I don't always use the worksheet. Um, it depends on the learner, it depends on the class, right? Um, like, for example, with um, when ESL instructors bring their classes in, I will definitely use the worksheet because, of course, there's some, you know, um, language barriers there and communication barriers there, and I want to make sure that they have as many avenues um, towards understanding, you know, information literacy as possible. Uh, so we have the PDF, we have the questions, and we tried it out in class. We had a lesson plan called Find the Faker, um, which was adapted to suit our needs originally from a lesson plan found online. Unfor hear all my passive voice there. Unfortunately, no one remembers where we got the original lesson plan. Uh, but when I came into this and was adapting it, we had already adapted it to um, account for our students' needs at the time, um, but we then adapted it further to account for fake news. Um, so what we do is um, divide the class into groups and distribute articles. And at the time, it was just four, three to four articles, but one of which was completely made up. Um, they weren't necessarily about the same subject. They weren't necessarily, um, you know, that regimented, but one, the, the, the point was find the faker, find the one that was completely made up. Um, so based on this plan, I tweaked it a little bit um, to account for this environment. Um, and the, the learning outcome was um, students uh, should be able to determine the viewpoint and bias of source material. So rather than random articles with a fake one thrown in, um, I chose articles on the same subject or the same event and then pulled from um, popular news sources from the far left, from the far right, from the center, like uh, Associated Press or Reuters, um, and then one that was completely fake. For the left at the top, you can see there, um, I was pulling from bipartisan report, which is not as bipartisan as the name might imply. Um, for the right, the second one you see there, um, return to normalcy, is from uh, the Daily Caller, uh, which is, a, again, a far right website. And for the center, uh, I pulled from Associated Press because they're pretty um, obviously reliable for that. And then for completely made up, Originally, I was using um, cbsnews.com.co, which we, of course, uh, all know is an indication of a fake site. Um, I have, this semester, I have changed, and I'll get to that a little bit later, I've changed where I, where I go for these um, news sites because bad websites change and they get worse. Um, and so, anyway, I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, but this is what I was using in the spring of 2017, these websites. And so I found um, four articles on the same topic. Uh, the examples I'm using here um, are about the, the transgender bathrooms and transgender rights um, that were very, very 
um, current at the time. And I, yeah, and I, and I, I tried to use a, a topic that was relevant or current or politically charged. And to frame the activity, um, we touched on kind of what bias means, right, and where we see bias. Uh, and most students through this guided group discussion were able to identify what bias was, right? It's an opinion, it's your personal ideas, um, your personal beliefs. Um, and we would get to the conclusion that bias was everywhere. And then um, we distributed the articles to three to four groups and gave them time to read the articles and discuss it in their groups to decide if the article was left biased, right biased, not biased, or completely fake. Um, this is a picture of one of our instruction labs, and you can see this room is especially conducive to group work. Um, as the students discuss their articles in groups, we circulate around the room, um, continuing to ask questions, to facilitate conversation between the students. And then we came back together as a you know large group and discuss each article and you know, we pull it up on the projector and and have each group kind of talk about their article and um, what they found about it um, what they found out about it what they decided together about it and um, this activity was fairly successful uh, even in its infancy uh, in the spring but we eventually ran into a problem at the end of the activity in one of the classes, um, you know, after these classes, we always kind of talk, especially when we're trying new things out, we all talk about what worked, what didn't, how it, how it went in class. And um, one of my colleagues, um, you know, when she asked the class at the end of the activity if there were any thoughts or questions, a student raised their hand and asked, what do you mean by left and right bias? And this really made us kind of realize, like, like I was talking before about, you know, we're taking uh, this knowledge for granted, right? Um, it, we had kind of assumed too much awareness um, or knowledge about politically biased language and how it's used, um, or even political beliefs. Uh, it also kind of made us wonder how many students didn't ask the question in previous sessions um, because, you know, some students don't want to ask questions in class um, or feel self-conscious about that. Um, and so even if they didn't understand what we meant by left and right bias, maybe they weren't getting the most out of this activity that they could. Um, so we decided we needed to frame the activity a little differently. Um, so what we um, started doing was um, beginning the activity not only about you know what bias is, opinion or personal beliefs, but also about the vocabulary of political bias. So we started with brainstorming words. Um, this picture is kind of an example of uh, a, a, a pretty typical example of the result of this brainstorming session. Um, so um, we write left on one side of the board and right on the other side, and then we ask questions like, what words do you hear the left use to describe themselves? Um, what words do you hear the right use to describe themselves? How do they describe each other? What are their standards? on some hot button issues right now like abortion or gun control um, and and sometimes it was hard to get the discussion going uh, I think partly because some students are a little reluctant to use you know the insulting words or the hard words uh, those that really bias language um, for fear of I don't know making someone angry or upsetting someone right um, so it is what a we lot of it is difficult topics and you worry about you don't know who's in the room and you worry about offending them. Right, exactly. And and, and again it speaks to that bias, right? We we have to set aside our own. Um and because we want everyone to just have a discussion about the language. Right. And feel comfortable doing that. Um 
So what we tend to try to do, you know, as we're starting this conversation with these difficult words and these difficult topics, um, we kind of issue a sort of disclaimer, right? Um, so I tend to say something along the lines of, you know, when we say these words, we're not talking about any one person in this classroom or anywhere else. We're speaking in generalities about groups of people so that we can be aware of this kind of language and what it means. That's just so we can identify the bias, not saying anything good or bad about either side. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a classroom. We're having a discussion about language so that we can all be more sophisticated consumers of information. Um, and eventually, students would come up with the target words we were looking for um, and would identify, you know, general positions each side takes on some key issues. Um, and you can see on this slide, this is, again, like a prime example example of how we visually represent the conversation with the students as we have the conversation. And so then this word bank is something that they can, you know, refer to as they're analyzing their articles. So armed with this word bank, um, they, they, they were then given the articles. Um, sometimes the class would really get into this conversation. Um, and would be saying words faster than I can write them down. <laughs> Other times, they take a little bit of coaxing, you know. Um, every class has its own kind of dynamic. Um, and so sometimes, you know, I, I'll use the bad, wor bad words, right, um, just to kind of get them going. But we always got, you know, something along the lines of what you see here. So then we put the students into the groups. Uh, and ask them to kind of skim the articles, looking for the language being used. Um, we encourage them to read it like they read um, their own news feeds, right? Do it quickly. See, see, just look for these words. Look for how is it making you feel initially? What does that say about the article's bias? What does it say about your own bias, right? Um, and this, this worked much better. And students were more often than not <laughs> able to accurately uh, identify the bias of their article. We also took the opportunity um, when, when we were as a larger group discussing the, the fake news article, article, the one that was um, actually made up, to talk, about, to talk about that term, fake news, okay? Um, fake news as we, understand it as sophisticated consumers of information um, and 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 how the term quote unquote fake news gets used now um, we made it a point to say you know fake news for us as we're doing research is something that's actually made up and not based in any verifiable fact um, but the way fake news gets used now is to dismiss what um, very well may be uh, very valid information, but it goes against your own beliefs. It goes against your own bias. And so if you dismiss it as fake news, then you don't have to actually address the facts within. And so we tried to take that, just that moment, that teaching moment to um, identify how we would view fake news as opposed to how it's portrayed now. Um, Let's see. So we would wrap up the activity with um, steering them to this website that I love called allsides.com. Uh, it's a wonderful website. Um, I'll, I'll talk about it again later. <laughs> uh, and it, what it does is it lists websites and rates them for left and right bias uh, as well as for neutrality. So obviously it's not a comprehensive list because who can do that um, but it does have most of the usual suspects um, it's got all, all the mainstream media but it's also got a lot of websites that I never would have even encountered in my life so um, it, it, it's a pretty extensive kind of catalog of websites and, and, and a catalog of their biases 
So introducing this, introducing them to this site uh, allows them, you know, as they're on their own and not in the controlled library environment, um, if they encounter a popular news site and they have a question about it, this is, you know, a, a really easy resource for them to kind of check themselves if there's that question. Is this a good site? Is this biased? It's kind of, I don't know, I can't tell. They can go to allsides.com and see um, what they say about it, and, and it, it is a reliable source for that. Um, we were always very explicit at the beginning and the end of the activity about why we were doing the activity. Um, this way, um, as we're doing the activity, you know, we kind of frame the activity, and at the end of it, students are very aware of why this information will be relevant to them um, and as they conduct their research and as they, you know, go through future projects or as they go through life, right? This is very, very valuable information, and these are valuable skills uh, for them to be um, more critical consumers of information. So that is how the activity <clears throat> kind of evolved over the spring of 2017. And we did receive a lot of positive student feedback. Uh, much of the evolution of the activity, like I think I mentioned before, was student driven um, and was based on their assessments of the activity. Many students reported that they had no idea how pervasive bias was. And as you can see on that top left post-it, um, if you look at that, they realized they may have been being influenced without realizing it. Um, that one on the top left is actually one of my favorite ones because they actually took the time to draw an emoji. Um, they were also... <laughs> they were also... I can't tell if that angry but smiling. I don't know. <laughs> it's that grunt face that like... Ah! I, oh, that, yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> nice. I like the um, top right too, and now I can spot the liars. Yes, yes. Guess, yeah. yeah. Um, we got a lot of feedback like that. Um, seeing, you know, and, and we always ask, you know, what was, what was awesome about this, what was great about this, what was the most helpful thing, and what would you improve? Um, having more time being one of the negative feedbacks that we had. Um, was they wanted more time. They wanted more time to talk about these things. Um, but, you know, we, we just don't have that time necessarily. Um, one of the things that we heard too was they were super excited about allsides.com um, and really, really expressed a lot of um, enthusiasm about being able to quickly check to see if a new site, new site you know, was biased or not. Um, and uh, not having enough time is hopefully a blessing in disguise that you would hope that that they would continue the conversation outside of the class outside the right. specific session because they had too much to say and yes. hopefully they'll continue uh, and carry it beyond the, the your specific you know classroom walls planting the seeds right <laughs> yes, <laughs> that <happened>. exactly <laughs> um in one of my classes, I actually had a student who um, I could actually I could tell, you know, by the end of the week, she was a very sophisticated consumer of information, and she was very well informed and and enthusiastic about it. Uh, and her feedback was um, that she would have rather spent more time in the databases than on this activity, since she already knew how to do all this. Um, but she did also say that she understood that not everyone one was as sophisticated as her, which I think we're seeing, right? Um, and, and so she understood why we did it. Um, but yeah, the, the most negative um, information that we got was, was they wanted more time to discuss or debate. And, um, you know, we, again, we just don't have time for that. And, and that's not really our role necessarily um, for, this, for this week, right? We're just trying to, trying to get them started and, and give, them, give them some tools. So. Um, but it was it was overall very very positive. So now what? Um, you know, it, fake news. Everyone's talking about it. It's getting to be the summer, um, and we're all kind of getting uh, a little battle weary um, with with everything that we're 
talking and, and the way th this news is getting used. Um, and we really needed to kind of make sure we were still keeping students active in being critical consumers of information. Um, at the same time, over the summer, uh, the director of our department, Research and Instruction Services, um, the instruction librarian, and I began doing assessments of a sampling of these papers um, that are the end product kind of, of um, that comp two semester, that eight to 10 page paper. So the three of us read 50 anonymized papers to evaluate how students were accessing and using sources for this, this research paper. And one thing that we noticed was that rather than clicking on hyperlinks in popular news sources to check and see where the authors were getting evidence, you know how um, I was talking about earlier, I have 20 tabs open at the same time. Um, they weren't doing that. They were stopping their dig at the popular source and frequently biased source. Um, they would have found a good statistic or a fact but they weren't taking that extra step to get to the primary evidence. And so we decided to incorporate a, an information chaining um, activity as a part of this bias activity to demonstrate how one piece of evidence or one event could generate multiple different news stories um, exhibiting different biases, right? They could, how, how, how one event or one news um, news item can be spun um, using language and images and things like that. So over the summer of 2017, um, I kind of developed and test drove with a, a summer comp two session, um, an information chaining activity um, as a follow up to that bias exercise. Um, what I did is I used an article that I'd actually seen used in one of the anonymous papers we read over the summer. So this is, you know, real life, these, this level of students um, accessing these popular sources, um, a real life, you know, piece of evidence that they think was good, right? And um, this particular article is from a website called Think Progress. Uh, and it's an article about how much fast food prices would rise if the minimum wage were raised to $15 an hour. Think Progress, if you don't know, is kind of a liberal think tank, um, although it's very, very well respected. Um, and the article itself is well written, doesn't use too much inflammatory language, um, it doesn't have any real overt bias, right? Um, so it was easy to see why this article would pass the crap test and even um, the five W's because it's not really a bad source. Um, so, but, but, but there's a better source because if you look in that first paragraph, there's a hyperlink that takes you to the evidence they use to generate their story. So in the activity, what I did is I, I had them all come to this website um, and ask them to look at that first paragraph and click on that hyperlink and tell me where it went. When they click on the hyperlink, um, it took them to the article you see there at the top. Um, uh, and we discussed as a class exactly what, what this is, what, the, what is this article? Uh, and, and would come to the conclusion, we came to the conclusion um, that it was a press release from Purdue University. Uh, about a study that they had recently published about the cost of raising the minimum wage. I then asked the students to Google the headline from the press release. The second image you see below is the Google search results when you Google the headline. Uh, and I pointed out some of the biased language that you can see in the headlines. And, you know, um, we discussed again, how one press release generated all of these different news stories. And I asked them to go back to the press release and scroll to the bottom. Um, and at the bottom of the press release page is the title and the abstract of the original study. So, 
you know, up to this point, we've talked about abstracts, we've talked about academic articles, we've had those discussions already, right? Um, and so I asked the class, of the, of the several things that we've just looked at, what do you think is the best source, right? Uh, and generally, by this point, they, they, they hit, as we've done the activity, but even, even this first test drive, um, they came up with the answer, the original study. Uh, and so then I, I capped it off with asking, so how are you going to find the full article? And of course they respond, at the library. Um, so I had them copy and paste the title of the actual study into our library catalog, and boom, there it was, right? Um, so Perfect. It, 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 <laughs> nice little bow on top of everything. Right? <laughs> Uh, and so um, we would have, you know, kind of a little, I don't know, debriefing. Uh, we had a little debriefing about digging into hyperlinks to get to the quote unquote best source and the importance of using and the importance and usefulness of using primary sources in your research paper. Because if you're using the primary source, you can put your own spin on it. Um, you can use it in the way that you want to make your argument, right? Um, instead of just taking someone else's bias for granted. So overall, um, initially, even in that first test drive, the activity was successful. And many of the students in the summer class reported that they had never thought to click on hyperlinks to check the evidence of news articles they read online, which is absolutely terrifying. Um, wow, yeah. yeah, that's that's stunning. I mean, the internet yeah. is full of links. That's what you're supposed to do is click on everything, isn't it? That's what those are there for. And I, I eventually, um, over the semester, I be began to compare the hyperlinks to a works cited page or a references page. This is this is their this is their evidence. So check it, <laughs> you know. Um, and 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 I think you know, this, this lack of checking hyperlinks is probably one of the reasons the fake news epi epidemic is so rampant, right? Um, people just aren't digging. They aren't digging, and oftentimes they're just reading the headline and sharing without reading the articles. That's exactly. a huge thing that people yeah. actually admit to, which mm -hmm. is stunning. But um, they just believe yeah. the title, the um, which the, the new fast food minimum wage study is completely wrong. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Daily Signal. That's another good or, right wing one. By the way. Compared but, yeah. to the other ones here that are just so a, a study calculates it, which is more of a just objective. Mm -hmm. Here's just a thing. Go read it yourself. You know. And exactly. Yeah. This, just looking at and, and so if, if somebody feels like raising the minimum wage is bad and they see new fast food minimum wage study is completely wrong, they might just share that, right, without mm -hmm. looking at the study, you know. And headline, certain headlines and titles you want, you tweak um, these, I assume this is something you mentioned, they tweak them to um, get, get your attention. Exactly. You know, clickbait. Make it more right. of a, yeah, clickbait or even just make the wording more of uh, um, uh, over the top. Yeah, you know, this is completely wrong. Or, oh my God, the prices are going to skyrocket because of the raise. You know, and then people are going to click on that more often than the Purdue study calculates. Exactly, that's kind of dry, exactly. dry and academic sounding. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, they, they and and again, that's why we ask them to look at like a fund, uh, the funding of a site. Um, you know, are they funded by click throughs, right? Um, or is it? And where are they? Why are they publishing this? Why are they? Why are they using this headline? You know, asking these questions. We really try to get them to be asking those questions, as opposed to just blindly receiving information. Um, uh, so, because it was so successful over the summer, and because we had that kind of feedback that people weren't thinking to click on hyperlinks, um, we decided to incorporate uh, this activity with the bias module as a part of the comp two instruction in the fall. Um, so, you know, we do have a lot of ground to cover in the week of library instruction. Uh, we can't, we can't do everything in a week. Um, but, uh, and some, some of the classes uh, meet for 75 minutes, 
two times a week, um, and but some meet for 50 minutes three times a week. And the bias activity alone um, that I kind of described earlier when we go through talking about bias and talking about language of the left and the right and then going through assessing the articles, this can take up to 45 minutes. Um, depending on the group, uh, it can take longer. Um, and so in the 50 minute class sessions, it can, it can be a little tight getting that information chaining activity in. Um, sometimes uh, what I would do is if you know the the bias discussion ran a little long rather than like having go having them go through the information chaining with me you know and, and having that more uh, in-depth conversation I'd truncate a little bit and just show that you model the behavior right this is what I do this is what you should do right um, and so then instead of it taking 10 or 15 minutes, it takes more like five. Um, so I think it's important and I think that it scaffolds really well with the bias activity um, because we've had that conversation about bias language. And then so when you get this, you know, Google search result where, you know, new fast food minimum wage is completely wrong, that we've had that conversation about bias language and they can see you know, immediately from the headline, like, man, I probably want to use that as a source, right? Um, and, and, and so they have that context kind of already. Um, but because, again, as, as it's terrifying that nobody uses, not nobody, but that they frequently don't use hyperlinks, um, we wanted to kind of try to get this information chaining activity to a broader audience. And so we expanded I expanded it um, into a workshop as part of our Lunch and Learn uh, undergraduate workshop series. And this is a series that's been developed um, by my colleague Monica Maher over the last several semesters. And the goal is um, aimed at addressing those specific needs of undergraduate researchers, undergraduate students. Um, they're 30 minute workshops. And they are done on Fridays from 12.15 to 12.45. And students bring their lunch if they want. And we provide coffee and candy. Students love free food. Um, and then we teach them some specific research strategies. And so I extended the activity to span the 30 minutes. Um, I created a PowerPoint. And I made sure to kind of do a little more in-depth conversation about the importance of clicking through hyperlinks um, and, and I did frame the activity in the workshop with a discussion about bias because it's important to, I think it's important to scaffold it that way. That you have to talk about bias before you can really talk about digging into these um, sources and these hyperlinks. Um, and um, and it, it wasn't nearly as in-depth, that, that bias conversation wasn't nearly as in-depth. It was just more of kind of a framing because, again, I only had half an hour. So, um, and then we do the information chaining kind of activity. Um, the workshop itself um, wasn't very well attended. It was kind of early in the semester. Um, but the students who did attend were, were very engaged with the activity. And I received a lot of positive feedback from them. Uh, and so we do have plans to kind of incorporate try to do this workshop again in the spring uh, and maybe push it a little more so that um, more people will come <laughs> and more people will become better consumers of information. Um, but we, of course, are always evolving. Um, we self-assess, we give each other feedback, we take uh, student assessment very, very seriously, and we're very active in seeking that feedback from our students so that we can honor their time and we can meet their needs um, and, and really maximize that time that they have in the library. We also uh, observe each other teaching and offer feedback. We collaborate with each other after classes to discuss what's working, what's not. Um, and this is how we can kind of tweak and adjust this um, even mid-semester. Um, kind of some strategies and activities and framing um, throughout the semester. Uh, over the fall 2017 semester, so a few issues did come up. One problem uh, we encountered was, uh, and actually, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I encountered this in class because I didn't think to check my own links. 
Um, the creator of the .com.co websites passed away. And so those sites are no longer a good resource for finding the fake news articles. And I went to the website and kind of turned it into a teaching moment, like, well, if you can't get back to the article, that might not be a good site. <laughs> um, yeah, if it's not like some known site like like an a AP or something that does archive historically everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and an interesting... Time. Right, exactly. That, that that means maybe you don't want to use that site. I did also, um, when using in the AP article, um, so I did a, a, a bank around, um, or a, one of the subjects I did was the hurricanes, and I had compiled my my bank, my, my articles, very early on in the news cycle, and when you go to AP, um, the same website, the same link, it had a different headline and the students got confused. And so that again was a teaching moment. Okay, so this is the Associated Press. They're a news wire. Um, and it's going to adapt and change as the news changes. Um, and then we have a conversation about news wires, um, which was also really cool. Um, but the, 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 the guy who came up with the .com.co websites, you know, cbsnews.com.co, um, are now just a bunch of ads. Those those websites are just ads, and the art you can't get back to those articles really. Um, That's what tends to happen when things lose their original ownership. <laughs> yeah. Yes, they just become ad sites, um, and and not that not that fewer fake news sites is a bad thing, um, but I had to find new sites <laughs> to get my fake news from, um, which is entertaining uh, or frustrating depending on my mood. Um, uh, but I'm always so I'm always updating our bank of articles. So what I'll do is um, take screenshots and then compile them into a PDF file, um, so then I can share it with my colleagues easily. It's easily stored, um, and it also allows me to you know kind of cut out the ads and the title of the website because we really want them to be thinking about the language and the images being used. Um, initially before they really start digging into the actual website. And I like to cover a variety of subjects. Um, like, as you can see on this slide, that headline, even hurricanes can be politicized. Um, and in fact, this article um, mm -hmm. is actually from a conspiracy website and it fooled a lot of students, this article itself, <laughs> because, yeah, it, because. Oh, come on. No, I know. <laughs> It's fake information, okay. but it's buried in biased language. Yeah. So they would say, oh, it's it's right biased. And I'm like, well, yes, but also, <laughs> um, it's also not based in fact, you know. Um, it's the plot of a movie. <laughs> Have exactly, you seen it? Right? You've, probably, you've probably seen this movie. <laughs> what was it, like, <laughs> something that that apocalyptic weather movie oh, I can't yeah remember. Uh, 2012 <laughs> which is coming on um, but yeah uh, they this one fooled them um, shockingly enough and terrifyingly enough um, it would it would fool them more often than other fake news articles um, they, they like I said they would identify the bias but they couldn't always identify it as fake um, but yeah, covering a variety of subjects also lets us discover things like this, but also choose something appropriate uh, for the group we're teaching. So we only spend a week with them, but we can generally get a pretty good read on you know, the group dynamic by the time we do this bias activity, because we do it at the end. It's like the last um, activity of the library instruction. And so some groups you can kind of tell won't be as receptive to more polarizing news, you know, like the transgender bathrooms or um, I tend to steer away from abortion because it's just so, I don't know, cliche, right? Um, and also it can be really emotionally charged. Um, so I'll have ones like about hurricanes, <laughs> okay, right? Um, which is really climate change. Um, uh, so we have, you know, transgender bathrooms, um, the indictments of you know, Paul Manafort, et cetera, um, some about gun control, but really you can find bias 
around anything. Um, uh, so it, it's it's pretty easy to find some good articles um, to use for for for, for our classes. Um, some of my favorite go-to sites, um, although if I need a fresher, uh, I'll just check out allsides.com and look for you know far left and far right and sift through those websites. Um, but my favorite conspiracy site, and it's where I got that hurricane article, is naturalnews.com. It's highly entertaining if you want to check that out just, you know, for fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty as as you're reading it with an awareness of what you're reading, yes. Exactly, yes. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's almost worth it just to be like, people read this and believe it and what? <laughs> um, it, it's, it's pretty juicy on the conspiracy fake news front. Um, <clears throat> the fa my, my favorite right biased news source is National Review, which um, is a pretty well known site, but it's not always well known for its bias. Um, I also will use Daily Caller for my right biased news, but it, it, it's, it's not as well put together of a site. So National Review is a little more nuanced and a little more challenging. Um, for them to figure it out. Um, and my favorite left bias news sources are Mother Jones um, or The Nation um, because again the bipartisan report kind of like the cbsnews.com.co sites is really I, I I don't know what happened there but it's mm -hmm. it's terrible um, anymore and it's pretty easy to tell it's not a good source um, so we like to challenge them a little more and then of course I rely on the Associated Press um, or Reuters for that center um, line. So um, that's how we have been teaching this to our students at UNO. Um, this is how we've been addressing this this epidemic of fake news. Um, and I, I think that our lesson plan and materials really could be adapted for any audience. Um, you know, depending on the articles you use mm -hmm. and the way you frame the conversation. Um, yeah, I was, I think I was noticing that as you're going through. I was a little, I'm concerned, it might not be the right word, but that this would be very much for academic libraries, universities, colleges. But no, you've got this set up to, that anybody, any library could use it. Some a library, If a public library or school library want to do a, a session on this for their, their students or their patrons, it would work. Or if they just wanted to... That, that handout, the one with you did the mm -hmm. the five the W's that you'd uh, yeah, yeah the bookmark with the two sides or thing that that would be an awesome thing for everybody to borrow. Yeah, yeah, and um, just have and, available. Yeah, yeah. My actually, my um, stepmother is a the director of the um, library in Glenwood, Iowa, and she I've I've shared you know just over over coffee and things like that, you know, um, what we've been doing. And she's like, I'm stealing that. I said, please do. <laughs> um, uh, everybody should know this stuff. Um, I think I think public libraries, I think school libraries at any level um, could adapt this, you know, being aware of your, your population, your patrons, their needs. Um, you can frame all of this and, and scaffold it in kind of the same way and have maybe those more in-depth conversations, right, in public libraries or in school libraries where we can't have that here because our main goal is use these resources and evaluate them and use them well, please. Um, we can't really get into that debate or get into those deeper conversations, but I think that you can in public libraries and you can um, even in school libraries, right? Um, and, and because students, college students aren't the only ones susceptible to this biased or fake news. I mean, it's everywhere. Um, and everyone of any age, is, you know, like I said, it's never too, you're never too young or too old to figure out how to be better consumer of information. Um, no matter what side you're on, you can form informed opinions about issues um, that are, that are based in fact, right? Um, to be, you know, to be able to think for ourselves is very empowering, and I think it's empowering for our students and our patrons um, to be able to think for themselves, right? To be able to know that they're coming from an informed stance, um, and to know when they're being lied to, and to know when they're being deceived, mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, so, if anyone wants any of these materials, I'm happy to share. 
um, lesson plans or the PDFs or any of you know our news article banks. Um, if you my email is right there um, at the end. So if you shoot me an email, I can send you the files. I've got them as PDFs or uh, Word docs, and I will be happy to share this so that you too can steal from us as we all steal from each other and use things and borrow things and adapt it um, so that you know more people are. Are, are getting on board with being informed um, citizens um, to form those opinions. So, um, yeah, if there are yes. any questions. Yeah. Let's get more of them out there and spread this knowledge. <laughs> Please. <laughs> share it with other people who weren't able to attend your sessions. What did you say, word of mouth or... Um, oh. um. <laughs> Spreading the seed, that's what you said something about, Planting yes. The yes. Planting Planting the, the seed, yes, elsewhere, yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so um, awesome! Thank you, thank you very much, Erin. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions? Um, nobody typed anything in during the session, um, but if you do, you can type it into your GoToWebinar qu the question section of your GoToWebinar um, interface, and I um, let's see here, can uh, pass that on to Erin <laughs> um, to answer if you have anything right now. Um, we are a little past eleven o'clock, but that's okay. Um, we we'll We're go not. as long as it takes. <laughs> That's okay. We started a few minutes after ten. This is okay. Um, we will, you know, if you yeah. have any questions, we'll make sure we stay on so that you can get them answered. Um, yeah, both, yeah, yeah. This, um, but I'll mention while we're you know waiting to see if anybody does want to type anything in. Uh, the recording of this will be done uh, probably later today, and it'll be available on our website. I will email all of you that. Um, this presentation, Aaron, if you want to send me. Um, uh, I think we're talking about a link or or the P or the PowerPoint of it, whichever works for you. Yep. Yep. Okay. And I will. Um, uh, I meant to do that along I'm with sorry. the. Report. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, whichever works for you, wherever you have it posted, or wherever you wouldn't. That, so that the um, actual power the presentation with all the good URLs and everything that you had on there um, would also be available to everybody. For sure. Yep. Afterwards, no problem. All right. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't look like anybody is desperately typing anything in. So I suppose okay. we will. Um, I guess we'll officially we can officially wrap it up for today. Um, you do have Erin's email address there if you do want to contact her with any other questions or comments or thoughts you have. Yeah, if you um, think of something later. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, or if you want her advice on how to you know do one of these sessions at your library, whether it's academic or public or school, wherever. Um, she definitely would be. I'm putting you out there. Would be available. <laughs> More than happy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, All right. Oh, oh, somebody is typing. Thank you, Aaron and others, for such a great presentation. And then a comment: Where is the emoji for of a smiling face? <laughs> we, I don't know. We don't have emoji like functionality built into our this go to webinar software. It's a little too much for that. <laughs> but that's okay. We get the point. <laughs> All right. I am going to pull presenter control over to my my screen now. Great. So we can wrap up today. So um, thank you very much, Erin, for being here with us today and presenting. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, as I said, uh, the session will be posted onto our website. This is our main Encompass Live website, nebraska.gov slash Encompass Live. If you uh, Google us with your search engine of choice, we are so far the only thing called that out there, so you should find us. Um, our current or upcoming shows are here, but right below that is a link to the archives, and this is where at the very top of this list after our um, will be the most recent uh, session. So this was last week's show. We've got recording and presentation uh, later today. Today's show will be added to the top of our list there. And everyone who attended today or was registered for today's session will automatically get an email from me uh, letting you know when it is available. Um, so I hope you join us for next week's show, which is the best new teen books of 2017. That would be in the opinion of Sally Snyder, uh, the Library Commission's Coordinator of Children and Young Adult Library Services, and Jill Annis, who is a school librarian at our Grandview Middle School um, in um, Elkhorn, Nebraska. So they will have um, some book talks on new titles um, in the, specifically for um, teens at your li um, that may be using your library, whether it's school or, or public. So definitely a register for that one. You'll also notice there is a follow-up one in the first session for January 2018. Sally will be with us to talk about 
children's books. Same idea, but um, for um, younger children. So uh, sign up for any of those shows. Also, Encompass Live is on Facebook. If you click here, we've got our links all over the site. It will pop you over to our Encompass Live Facebook page where we do post notifications of things to keep people up to speed. Here's a reminder to log into today's show. Um, we have notices of when new shows are coming, when the recordings are being made available. So if you are a big Facebook user, please do uh, give us a like on Facebook and keep up with what we are doing over there. Other than that, that wraps it up for this morning's show. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending, and we will see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.